The most common type in coal is fracture, which is fracture of the distal radius that has characteristic backward displacement of the hand. It is a low energy fracture, extra articular, with dorsal displacement of the distal fragment. It usually uh, occurs in patient above the age of 50 years old when the attempt to break a fall with an outstretched hand. The fracture is sometimes referred to as a dinner fork deformity fracture due to the shape of the fractured forearm. You can see that the deformity looks like a dinner fork and the, you see the dorsal displacement of the distal fragment. TFCC tears occur in about 50% of extra-articular distal radius fractures versus one-third in intra-articular fractures. The dorsal comminution is significant and important. If the comminution is up to 50% of the dorsal cortex, then treatment with a cast will not work. Some people believe one-third of the cortex comminution will prohibit using a cast. The more dorsal comminution, the more dorsal flexion of the fragment, the more chance that the fracture will not be treated adequately with the cast and they're going to be failure of the cast treatment. Coley's fracture that extends to the DRUJ has the worst prognosis. Another type is a Smith fracture. Predominantly an extra-articular transverse fracture that's palmarly displaced and is always thought to be a reverse Coley's fracture. You can see that the fracture fragment is displaced ventrally or palmarly. It could occur from a fall into a flexed rest. A Smith fracture has multiple types. Type 1 is extra-articular transverse fracture through the distal radius, and this is the most common type. Type 2, the fracture crosses into the dorsal articular surface, and type 3 enters the radiocarbal joint similar to volar barton fracture. So volar barton fracture equals a Smith type 3 fracture. Both will involve the intraarticular distal radius and will include possible dissociation of the carbal bones. You can see the three types of a Smith fractures and type 3 looks like volar barton fracture. And type 1 looks like Coley's fracture, but it's really a reverse Coley's fracture. Look at the volar direction of the fragment. Volar approach and plating and supporting this fragment is usually the treatment for this fracture. Here you can see the difference between Coley's fracture and the Smith fracture from displacement of the fracture. The colis is dorsal, the smith is palmar or volar. The other type is die punch fracture. Die punch fracture is a depressed fracture of the lunate fossa from an axial load which is transmitted through the lunate bone. There are interarticular fractures of the lunate fossa always check to see if there is any other carbal bone dissociation. Another interesting type, you call it Barton fracture, which is intraarticular fracture of the distal radius with dislocation of the radiocarbal joint. This fracture can be either dorsal or volar, Check for carbal disruption or dissociation. Barton fracture is caused by a fall on an extended and pronated rest. Usually the volar type is the most common type. 
and the fragment is usually a smaller in dorsal Barton fracture. The volar Barton fracture is the fracture of the volar margin of the distal radius, which is associated with subluxation of the radiocarbal joint. The most striking finding is subluxation or dislocation of the rest with that small fragment. You can see in that picture the strong volar radiocarbal ligament avulses the volar lip of the radius and the hand and the wrist is dislocated with that fracture fragment. This fracture is very similar to a Smith type 3 fracture. The treatment of volar Barton's fracture is usually surgery by a volar approach and volar plate. Dorsal Barton, dorsal shearing force, the disradius fracture with dislocation of the radiocarbal joint, the fracture is interarticular and it involves the dorsal lip. You can see that the wrist is dislocated. The avulsed fragment is usually small. The treatment is open reduction internal fixation through a dorsal approach. The last type is the Schoeffer fracture, with a fracture of the styloid process with scapholeonate dissociation. Is usually caused by compression of the scaphoid against the styloid process, shearing it off. And you probably will have a scapholeonate dissociation at that point. With Schoeffer fractures, evaluation of the radial styloid fracture should always include supinated view of the rest so the scapholeonate dissociation can be ruled out. Look for major swelling of the rest and easy deformity on the lateral x-rays with widening of the gap between the lunate and the scaphoid bones on and the AP view. So what is dizzy deformity? The scapholeonate angle is usually approximately about 47 degree. It can be up till 60 degree. Any angle of the scapholeonate that's more than 60 degree is considered abnormal and you can usually see that in DZ because of the palmar flexion of the scaphoid. That means there is a scapholeonate dissociation or a problem. So the leonate goes one way, the scaphoid goes the other way. Do no longer work together as a team. The treatment of Schoeffer fracture usually treated by compression lag screw fixation of the radial styloid process. Then you're going to assess the scapholeonate joint for possible stabilization. On conclusion, there's a lot of types for the distal radius fracture. When you assess the x-rays, you need to see if there's any involvement or the dorsal or volar rim of the radius. Check for involvement of the DRUJ and look for dye bunch lesions. Check for dislocation of the rest and the direction of the displacement of that dislocation. Also please check the carpal disruption to see if there is any dissociation between the carpal bones. Thank you very much.